Everyone wants to talk about these stages that an ex goes through during the no contact rule as if there's some one size fits all solution. The no contact rule. About stages that your ex must go through during no contact. No contact rule 101. No contact with your ex. No contact always works. No contact rule is a popular strategy. Stages your ex goes through while in no contact. And I get it, I, I really do. It's really easy to sell this ideal that there are these stages that are stationary that every ex falls into. But if you really think about it, that's really not how exes or breakups in general work. Check this out. This is a poll I conducted a few years ago where I asked my clients what attachment style they believed that their ex has. 67% of respondents said that they believe that their ex had dismissive avoidant tendencies, and 20% said they believe that their exes had fearful avoidant tendencies. So you're going to sit here and tell me that someone with a fearful avoidant attachment style is going to behave the exact same way during the no contact rule as someone with a dismissive avoidant attachment style? No. You know that's not true, and I know that's not true. So let's stop pretending that it's true. Look, my job isn't to sit here and tell you what you want to hear. It's to sit here and tell you what you need to hear. So here goes. I'm going to take you through the major stages that an ex will go through from the perspective of both a dismissive avoidant and a fearful avoidant. Seeing as from how our poll that accounts for basically 90% of the exes that we're looking at here. Let's start with the dismissive avoidant first, since that seems to be the most popular type of X out there. Okay, so what's the major difference between a dismissive avoidant and a fearful avoidant? Well, I like to think of insecure attachment styles as being on a spectrum. On one side, you have very avoidant traits, and on the other side, you have very anxious traits. Now, someone who's a dismissive avoidant will most likely exhibit avoidant traits when faced with conflict. Whereas someone who is a fearful avoidant will swing from the avoidant side to the anxious side and then back to the avoidant side. So the first stage for the dismissive avoidant is going to be separation elation. Now, I've talked about this a lot in other videos, but our research shows that dismissive avoidant exes tend not to reach out at all during the no contact rule. One of the reasons that I believe this is the case is that dismissive avoidance, whose core wound revolves around this independence, sort of enter into this party phase. Look at this quote from Free to Attach. After a relationship ends, people with an avoidant attachment style tend not to show much anxiety or distress, often feeling an initial sense of relief at the relinquishing of obligations and the sense that they are regaining their self-identity and not tending to initially miss their partner. This is separation elation as the pressure to connect is gone. So believe it or not, someone with a dismissive avoidant attachment style will kind of be overjoyed by the fact that they've gotten their independence back. In other words, they're gonna be happy that you're gone at first. The second dismissive avoidant stage is feelings beginning to bubble to the surface. And what's interesting is stage one, the separation relation stage can last anywhere from six to eight weeks. I've often referred to the stage as the second honeymoon period stage. And technically that means that the entirety of the no contact rule can happen during stage one. After that though, you kind of see them sober up a little bit and they kind of start surfacing thoughts where they are going through the breakup to understand it. And I really like what our very own Dr. Tyler Ramsey had to say about this. But the interesting part is, is that you would think that they would try to process that and, you know, move on in that capacity, but they don't. <laughs> and so they actually take higher initiatives to suppress it again. And they will go right back into their shell again to try and do everything they can to keep a lid on those emotions. So essentially stage one is all about avoiding. Stage two is where those feelings begin to bubble to the surface, which leads us pretty seamlessly to stage three, resuppression. Now, personally, I feel like stages one and two are in this constant state of flux. 
It's a constant back and forth. Avoid feelings, then the feelings began to surface, then you avoid those feelings, and those feelings began to surface again, and on and on we go. This back and forth actually continues through stages two and three as well. If feelings bubble up, you begin to suppress them. If feelings bubble up again, you begin to suppress them again. Honestly, that's stage three for a dismissive avoidant during the no contact rule in a nutshell. Stage four is where things get really interesting. This is where the dismissive avoidant decides they're gonna move on. So when you see the first few stages in this constant state of flux, you know, on, off, hot, cold, eventually the avoidant side will win out. After all, we're dealing with avoidance here and they love to suppress things. That, or they tend to move on to someone new and engage in what I like to call the self-fulfilling cycle. You've heard me talk about this before, it's the avoidant death wheel. Basically, all avoidants are caught in this loop, jumping from one relationship to the next, searching endlessly for the one. It's just that for them, the one is often a deactivation strategy. It's this ideal that they have to ensure that they don't ever have to commit to someone because no one can ever measure up to this new person or this one. The interesting part is though, that when they do try to move on, they typically try try to get into another relationship, but it's usually not right after the breakup. Remember, we're talking about dismissive avoidance here. They're not quite as aggressive as fearful avoidance, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. But usually a dismissive avoidant will seek out someone very similar to you. So generally you're gonna find them getting into a relationship with someone who looks like you, likes the same things as you, travels to the same places as you, and the process just repeats again over and over and over, which is often why they're in and out of relationships throughout their dating history. The wheel, after all, is ever turning. Stage five for dismissive avoidant is really where the nostalgia begins to kick in. Let's start with a quote from Free to Attach. Avoidants are free to long for an ex once that person is unavailable out of a relationship and typically out of contact so they are untouched by actual engagement and their deactivation systems aren't triggered which of course reveals their long suppressed attachment and switching their operating attachment womb from the fear of engulfment to the fear of abandonment. It's only when an avoidant feels safe that they allow themselves to open up and miss their exes. They only usually essentially feel safe when two things are happening. Number one, you have to leave them alone, which the no contact rule kind of addresses. And number two, they really need to realize that the dating landscape out there doesn't compare to what they had with you. This is why we see so many exes coming back after the fact. Like this voicemail I got and I think my third ever podcast interview. Check this out. Hi, my name is Natalie and my question is this. It's been almost two years since the breakup with my ex and I have since then started my own business and started dating. I feel at 100% with my confidence. I've noticed that he's been calling and texting me a lot more often and telling me how proud he is of me and that I look really good. When we were together, I stopped following my dreams and going out with friends to be closer to him, realizing now all it did was push him away. Would you say having your own life, despite fear of losing a man, actually does the opposite and keeps him interested? Now, this is a textbook dismissive avoidant who circles back around after getting this nostalgic reverie. Makes sense, right? Well, Wait until you hear how fearful avoidance operate during the no contact rule. All right, let's back up and start from the beginning with fearful avoidance now. All right, stage one for a fearful avoidant is what I like to call the complete shutdown. So where the dismissive avoidant was all about happiness and separation relation, the fearful avoidant generally will shut down and deactivate more than a dismissive avoidant at first, which you really wouldn't expect from a fearful avoidant. Often you'll see a fearful avoidant exhibit bad behaviors that may have been present in previous years. Some of the most common coping mechanisms for a fearful avoidant will be things like drinking a lot of alcohol, going on a lot of dates with a lot of different people, going as far as sleeping with some of those dates, you name it. I guess the more interesting question to ask at this point though is, why? What's the psychology behind why they keep engaging in all this very self-destructive type of behavior? Dr. Ramsey offers his take. Is some kind of factor that's 
within the parents as well. And so you see a lot, in, in most of the time you see with fearful avoidant, they have some kind of trauma aspect to them, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual abuse, you see a lot of these things with them as well. And so, cause it's so many inconsistencies that they weren't really, or should not have been subjected to in an early child. All right, the second big stage for fearful avoidance during the no contact is the feelings beginning to bubble to the surface. This should sound familiar to so the suppression of emotion that you see happening for fearful avoidance in stage one doesn't last forever. After all, they're fearful avoidant, they're going to swing from anxious attachment styles to avoidant attachment styles back to anxious attachment styles. It's a whole thing. Many times you'll find that fearful avoidance will often try to convince themselves that they have no feelings left, especially if that relationship's end was based on a spur of the moment decision by them. However, the recovery is usually quite quick, thanks to their very much oscillating pattern of anxiety to avoidance, back to anxiety, back to avoidance. You'll notice this common theme throughout these stages. So when a fearful avoidant is given space, they tend to shift from emotional reactions to more logical thinking. Think of it as a sobering up experience for them. The distance from the emotionally charged situation often will lead to a reemergence of their suppressed feelings. And then we come back to fearful avoidance stage three, which is the pendulum really starts to begin to swing. Now we've hinted at this in stage two, but really stage three is where this comes in full force. Without a doubt, this is the most popular stage that people tend to associate with fearful avoidant individuals. I always try to tell my clients to view fearful avoidant behavior as being on a spectrum. On one side, you have anxious core wounds, which revolves around the fear of being abandoned. And on the other side, you have an avoidant core wound, which revolves around a fear of losing your independence. And just like a pendulum, you'll find that a fearful avoidant will swing from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. When they're anxious, they'll act anxiously. When they're avoidant, they're going to act incredibly dismissive avoidantly. So in the interview I did with Dr. Ramsey, he talked about this concept a lot and gave some insight into the complicated nature that goes behind it. It's fearful avoidant and they actually have anxious and avoidant qualities. And so those, those people possess them both. So depending upon who they're with depends on what side you're more going to see. So typically, you know, you're the anxious partner and you're with a fearful avoidant, let's assume you're probably going to see more of the avoidant qualities. And so just because that's usually ultimately, this is the stage where you're going to see a lot of mixed signals. And for many who date individuals like this, it can really feel like you're dating Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Fearful avoidance stage four is of course, they attempt to move on. Either the resuppression or the rejection will win out eventually, and they try to move on. But it's interesting to note that this stage can never really occur if you push them too far with anxious behavior. This is all assuming you are giving the fearful avoidant space via the no contact rule. If that's the case, then they themselves are usually tired of the pendulum swing going on within. They're tired of that anxious side attacking themselves. In a lot of ways, fearful avoidance are very complex people. On the one hand, they possess a deep sense of empathy, which really makes them sensitive to causing others pain. When faced with a partner's anxiety, they often feel guilt. They internalize that. And this guilt that they get stemmed from this core belief that they're not good enough. And this is a feeling that inadvertently is often reinforced by the people that they date who are saying you need to be more present or you need to back off a little bit. And this negative self talk that they have going on within themselves just from relationship to relationship gets reinforced and repeatedly triggering this core wound can be very traumatic for them. Continuous expressions of dissatisfaction or feelings of neglect by their partner reinforce their fear of inadequacy. As a result, they may reach a tipping point where the emotional burden becomes unbearable. And so to protect themselves from further hurt or feelings of inadequacy, they might choose to distance themselves permanently. This dynamic is really quite delicate. That anxious person might not realize that their actions 
which are meant to seek reassurance, could actually be reinforcing a fearful avoidance, deepest insecurities. Now, I'm not defending fearful avoidance, just trying to help you understand this is how they operate. It's ultimately a cycle where the anxious partner's attempts to seek validation end up validating the fearful avoidance deepest fears. So yeah, that's stage four. Stage five of the fearful avoidant is the nostalgia loop. It's all about this fearful avoidant getting hit with this wave of nostalgia. So when a fearful avoidant eventually becomes more stabilized and they start to feel kind of okay about the way things are going, they can sometimes enter into this phantom X stage. Remember that quote from Free to Attach that I cited a little bit earlier? You know, the one about how it's only when you've moved on or they've moved on that an avoidant will feel comfortable missing you and having nostalgia? Well, that's this stage. A fearful avoidant will start thinking, man, I miss this about my ex. Or I remember how good it felt during the good times. They get caught up in this nostalgia loop. But it's important to note that the nostalgia loop alone usually isn't enough to make anyone come back. Remember, some avoidance, and technically fearful avoidance, while containing anxiety, is still very much an avoidant. They almost always prefer to have these phantom X ideals in their head, no matter how anxious they can get. In fact, according to Dr. Ramsey, but they usually seek out, and this is actually kind of hilarious, they seek out someone similar to you because they remember they don't really learn from their old patterns. So <laughs> they do go after similar people in that regard. So they're gonna seek out people that look a lot like their ex in the process now repeats again, which is why they're in and out of relationships a lot. So what typically happens with fearful avoidance is they engage in this comparison game. They often rebound and tend to constantly compare everyone they meet with the key characteristics they value in this one partner. Ultimately, this leads to a very distorted view of relationships. They're expecting perfection without any hardship or emotional vulnerability. If a relationship does have these problems with it, then they just simply conclude, hey, this is the wrong person for me. Ultimately, they end relationships and they justify that decision by this unrealistic expectation or standard that they've set in their mind. And this mindset occurs because they've been constantly doing this throughout their lives, constantly cross-pollinating and trying to compare this relationship from this relationship to this relationship to this ideal relationship. They believe that an ideal partner should encompass all of the positive attributes they've encountered and they shouldn't have to put in any effort on their part. And that is the fearful avoidant.